presenting. There we go. Um, the Master Gardeners are part of the University of Arizona Cooperative Education Extension. Um, every county in Arizona has a cooperative extension office. And you might be familiar with some of our other programs, such as 4-H, food safety, nutrition education, STEM, and commercial horticulture, and small acreage support. <clears throat> the master gardeners are the ones that provide science-based horticulture information. And tonight's presentation is on Arizona bats. Now, our presenter tonight is Lauren Paz. Lauren moved to Prescott Valley after retiring in 2014. She came up became a master gardener in 2019 and has served as the speaker's bureau chair for the past two years. She's an avid backyard gardener. Uh, she applies all the information um, to all the aspects of caring of her yard and that of her community and promoting good stewardship, stewardship of our environment. Her passion is to educate people in the art of growing and eating healthy foods but she also loves presenting specialty topics like bats. So I am really excited to hear this presentation tonight. So Lauren, take it away. Okay, so this is a topic that's been requested by many people and I took it on to research and it was the most fascinating topic I've ever come across. So I hope to share all the fat facts that I've learned over the last couple of months when we, um, when I started researching. And here you have the first one, a face that only a mother could love. Could you imagine this guy coming face to face with you in the middle of the night? Um, so bats are um, just a general description of them. They're fist, fist, fist sized or smaller with short fur and thin wings. And many have large ears. They're brown, gray, yellow, red, and some have frost-tipped fur and spots that, um, that look like they have dark eye masks. Of course, we all know that bats like to hang upside down to rest. And um, they actually have similar eyesight to humans. So bats belong to the order of, and I hope I get this right, Cherup Cheruptera, meaning hand wing. And as we know, they are a mammal. So they do have body structures within their wings and they are the only mammals to possess the true powers of flight. So bats make up over 20% of all living mammal species and they're in two suborders, the mega and the micro cherubotra. The mega are very large, they're old world and most of them are fruit eating bats which um, they usually find their food just by using their eyesight. The micro cherubotra bats tend to be much smaller and they feed primarily on e uh, insects and they use the ecolocation system, uh, system, which we are gonna be talking about with many different bats today. Bats are one of the most diverse and widespread groups of mammals on the planet today. They are found on every continent except for Antarctica. There are between 1100 and 1400 species of bats worldwide with 40 of the bats specifically uh, in the United States. Uh, fact, more facts about bats. They are, are considered mammals um, and are well known for their excellent ability to hear from far away distances. Again, it's that echolocation system. They emit these very high pitched chirps, most of which we cannot hear. I think there's only two bats that have a low enough frequency that we could hear as they're uh, doing their chirps. Um, they can buy their by the ecolocation system, they can uh, calculate the things as distance, speed, direction of the sounding objects, and that help them hunt for prey. It's almost like the submarine uh, systems as far as their pings and figuring out where their enemy may be. Um, I have a picture here just as a, a sample. These are the flying foxes. They are the world's largest bat that lives on the islands of South Pacific, and they actually have a wingspan up to six feet. So as we keep thinking of our little bats that fly around and eat our insects, uh, the six foot bat would probably scare the pants off of us if it came through our backyard. In contrast, the world's smallest bat is the bumblebee or kitty hood's nose bat of Thailand. And it is smaller than a thumbnail and has a wingspan of about six inches, weighs less than a penny. 
Um, bat species can live up to 30 to 40 years. Um, many will live less, but that's dependent on their habitat in terms of how much food, water, and um, sadly enough, a lot of their habitats are being destroyed as uh, the cities are being built out and vegetation from trees are being uh, cut down. More than half the bat species in the United States are in a severe decline because of the loss of habitat and also a new disease that has recently been discovered is the white nose disease. And that is in the south, southwestern part of the United States. Some bats hibernate in caves through the cold months, um, but they can also survive freezing temperatures after being encased in ice. So they go into a dormancy in, in a hibernation. Um, they can fly at speeds of up to 60 miles per hour or more. And a study at the University of Tennessee found that the Mexican free-tailed bat, which we have here in Arizona, can reach speeds up to 100 miles per hour, making it the fastest animal on earth. Bats can find their food in total darkness. Not all bats are nocturnal, meaning that they're awake at night. Um, many of them will look for food during the day. So I think we have one more page of bat bats facts, but bats produce only once a year. Most species in Arizona have only one pup, sometimes two, and they mate and have pups between the May and July period. Now, if you go to any of the Arizona caverns, um, you will probably see it cordoned off not to disturb their roosts. So the female nurse Females nurse their offspring and form maternity roosts that can contain hundreds or thousands of bats. Although the mother only nurses her own, they do take care of the surrounding bats and make sure they're protected from uh, invaders. Bat mothers can find their babies among thousands or millions by their unique voices and scents. And having only one pup a year makes this bat, their bats just generally extremely vulnerable to extinction. Many bats, if their roosts are um, bo bothered by either human or other, other animals, may abandon it and then not have another baby for another year to two years. Bats can consume their body weight in insects every night. And when we talk about the number of insects that they can consume, it's just amazing. So here we have a raff and skew big-eared bat. And again, I'm just throwing some pictures up to get some unique pictures of, of bats in different locations and in different places. Um, this bat can emit an inaudible high pitched sound of 10 to 20 beats per second, and it listens to its echoes coming back at them to determine where its food is. So let's go to the benefits of bats. Um, you know, I talked to my friends about bats and I go, oh, we don't like bats. But I don't think people realize how much they are our allies in, um, in our gardening efforts. Um, they love insects and so they will swarm early in the late at evening and the early morning, just back and forth in your yards, eating all your insects. That keeps them off of your plants. They are also responsible for pollinating very many different types of plants. They contribute at least 3 billion annually to the US agriculture economy through pest control and pollination. They are the primary dispersers of seeds in tropical habits and play a major role in reestablishing vegetation after logging or deforestation of building roadways. Um, the way they pollinate is as they go into say trumpet uh, flowers, say on cactus, all that pollen gets on their fur. And as they go one place to the other, just like a bumblebee, they begin their pollination. Bat droppings are called guano and are one of the richest fertilizers around. Bat guano was once Texas's largest mineral, mineral export before oil. So what do bats eat? Well, obviously they eat insects. Um, most bats of the flying, uh, feed off of flying insects such as mosquitoes, moths, beetles, and other insects. Food can include insects that congregate in areas near lights, um, plain fields, ponds, and other resources. They, there are also the nectar feeding bats and they are attracted to the flowering agaves and hummingbird feeders. It is known that, that they can um, drain a hummingbird feeder in less than, than six hours overnight. 
The other water sources can include pools, ponds, lakes, and with a long flying corridor that they can skim over just, again, just as an airplane goes in and skims to get the water up. Once a larger bat hits the ground or in the water, they will have a, a great difficulty getting back up again. Um, they, bats can, in flight, can eat more than 1,000 insects in an hour. Now, if you think you have insects and you don't see any bats around, you probably don't have enough insects to feed a population of bats in the area. Some small species have been known to eat up to 12,000 mosquito-sized insects in an hour, and it's estimated that a single large colony of free-tailed bats in Texas eat about 200 tons of insects in a night. There are two species of Arizona bats who are considered nectar-eating bats. Um, it's the lesser long-nosed and the Mexican long-tongued bats, and their primary source of food is the saguaro, the pipe, and, and organ cactus, and agaves. We'll see some of those bats um, in a little bit. Pallid bats are interesting because they eat scorpions and are immune to the scorpion stings, even from the most venomous scorpion in North America, the Arizona bark scorpion. So up to 70% of the bat pallid bats diet can come from scorpions and certain times of the year. So where do they live? Well, we all know that they live in caves um, because that's, that's the mystery of bats, but they can almost live anywhere. They do inhabit all forest of our habitats, which are grassland, savanna, forest, and desert in Arizona. Of the 28 bat species, only six do not spend time in the forest habitat. And besides caves, they're attracted to spaces inside buildings, attics, under bridges, culverts, um, in the palm trees, in any porches, in anything they can actually cling to and it doesn't have to be very big they can they can hang on to a bump that's only one sixteenth of an inch they can also squeeze into holes as small as three eighths of an inch and therefore you can see the issue if you have any holes up in your uh, uh, your roof area they can certainly invade your roof and love the habitat that would be there um, bats are in an area because there is food and there is water and there is shelter. And if you don't have those three combinations, you probably will not see a bat in your area. So what do you do if a bat's inside a building? Is it just lost? Um, you have to close the interior doors to confine the animal only to one room and then set and section it off from the building. You wait and after dark, you open all the doors and windows of that room and it will most likely fly outside on its own. Turning inside lights off helps the bat find the open windows and the doors. If the bat does not leave on its own after several hours, put on your leather gloves and place a box or coffee can over the bat as it's on the wall, slide a piece of paper and try to get it out of the house while it's dark. Hold the bat high enough up in the area or on an edge so that it actually can fly away. If it's on the ground, it may not be able to take off. So bat proof your home. You wanna remove your bug lights because the bug lights that are right next to your doorway are attracting the bats and that will get possibly mean that they're gonna come in your house and turn off the sources um, and, and turn off all your lights on the outside to avoid attracting night bats. Find it, all the entry exit points in your area, hang light, we, lightweight wire screening or hard cloth over the entry and exit holes and attach it to the side, top and sides. If you have bats inside, leave a bottom loose at the bottom so that they can crawl out, but they will not be able to re-enter. If you believe that you've got all the bats out of your attic, your house permanently secure that entry hole and they will not come back. Never ever exclude your bats during the summer months from May to September, because if they are in your, in your uh, attic or up high in your garage, this means it's maternity uh, period and they may have babies. They only leave to uh, get their food and then they come back and you don't want to have the babies left unattended. Um, so what bats, what diseases do bats carry? Well, you know, everybody's afraid of bats and rabies. 
Um, they are known to have rabies in the in some of the vectors in Arizona, but less than one percent of bats are likely to have rabies at any given time. It is more likely that you're going to find a squirrel or um, a, a rodent in your area that is more likely to have bats. Symptoms of a rabid bat could include inability to fly, flying during the daylight, lethargic, and paralysis. Most bats, even if sick, will not attack a person, but bats may bite if you handle them. If a live bat is on near the ground, please leave it alone and contact your local county health or animal control agency. And obviously, if bitten by a bat, just as any other animal, seek immediate attention. And if possible, capture the bat so it can be tested for rabies. So one of the uh, diseases that you can find from bats is histoplasmosis. And this disease is caused by a fungus that lives in the soil, which is enriched by either bird or bat droppings. The fungus is rare in very dry Western climates, but is found, it is found in Arizona. It can also be present in um, dry, hot attics of uh, buildings. This is an infection cause that is caused by inhalation of the airborne spores in dust enriched by animal droppings. The majority of the histoplasmosis cases in humans is asymptomatic and results only like flu-like systems. Some symptoms through individuals may, may become seriously ill if exposed to large quantity spore-laden dust over a period of time. The disease can be avoided by not breathing dust suspected of being enriched by animal feces. So we go back to wearing our masks again. Um, we're gonna call this one PD, because I'm not about to say it, but this fungus causes the white nose syndrome, WNS in bats, and was present in samples collected from multiple species in the Southeast California and Northwest Arizona. White nose syndrome has killed millions of bats in North America. And this disease is not known to pose a direct health risk to humans, um, and pets other than, the, the, other than the bats themselves. So sick and dying bats observed during the winter may have signs of WNS and can lead scientists to important roosting locations. And the, the federal government and state agencies ask you to report any sick or dead bats found on landscapes and just not ignore them because they are trying to identify if the white nose syndrome is invading our area. And the website is www.whitenosesyndrome.org, and you can get a lot more information on how to report a sick or dead bat. So I've been asked the question, so I looked it up. So the is the bats um, is COVID nineteen related to diseases communicated by bats? And there is a Bat Conservation International website. Um, from Wuhan, China, and it, it believes to be the source of an outbreak of the coronavirus in humans. Bats there are among the variety, varieties of wildlife sold at the marketplaces in Wuhan, and has shown that the virus now known as COVID-19 shares 96% of its genome with SARS-like coronaviruses. Horseshoe bats in China are the natural wildlife reservoirs for SARS-like coronaviruses. Now, we're not saying that they are the cause, but they certainly could help spread it. And if you'd like more information on it, go to cdc.gov coronavirus. Now, there are laws and policies, um, both in the federal level and in Arizona, that protect bats. You cannot kill or collect bats. And, and proper exclusions being that you have bats in your house and you need to to rid your house of them must be performed by trained and licensed persons. It is unlawful to use pesticides or other chemicals against bats and bat exclusions should be done with the advice of the Arizona Game and Fish Department or wildlife control businesses. Exclusion should not be attempted again during the maternity season from May to September so that we can avoid separating the mothers from their young. And no fumigants or toxins are registered for bat control in Arizona. So we're going to look at some bats in our area. And they really start getting classified as the Sonoran Desert region bats. But you can see by this map, it's much more than just the south 
uh, west part of Arizona. It can go down and it goes also down into Mexico and part of California. So in the Sonoran Desert, there are approximately 70 species of bats that reside in this area. Specifically, 28 known species of bats are second only to Texas. There are nine different mitosis species of bats in Arizona. We were gonna we'll look at a couple of those in a minute. Um, Sorraro National Park in Southern Arizona has the most Arizona bat species, which is the most in any part of the United States. And Arizona also has canyon bats, which is the Western pipistrel, and it is the smallest species of bat in the United States. And they are the size of, about, of, of a butterfly. The Mexican free-tailed bat is quite prevalent in, in Arizona. It's one of the most common species in Phoenix and is thought to be the most abundant mammal in earth. Some colon, colonies of these species number in the tens of millions. So the Arizona Game and Fish Department installed a bat roost camera at the Clough Ranch Wildlife Area near Safford in southern, southeastern Arizona. I've been on it many times looking at the bats. Um, we have it at the bottom of the screen here, but it's www.azgfd.com backslash wildlife backslash viewing backslash webcam bats. And it is a live showing the best time to look at this webcam if you're interested is either in the very early dawn hours or in the um, at dusk where you see bats either coming and going. Um, I found that when I looked at it, the dawn to 10 a.m. was you had the best visibility um, to see them as they're flying in and looking for their young. So um, bats that frequent Yavapai County, um, we have six, seven of them, the cave myotosis, the Arizona myotis, the fringed myotis, we can see we have a common theme here, the big brown bats, Mexican free-tailed bats, and the big eared bats. Um, they are found mostly in the cave bat, myotis bats are found in our desert areas. Um, they inhabit the mine shafts, caves, and under bridges, and will only be in caves that are near water sources. Um, the Arizona myotis prefers the, the ponderosa pines and oaks and forests, and they'll find them in the Mingus Mountain and Verde Valley. The fringed myotis occurs in the oak woodlands, including our Bradshaw Mountains. The big brown bats are found in, also found in the wooded areas, but can be present in the desert scrub. Although this species may hibernate during part of the winter, they can withstand cold wet weather well. Mexican free-tailed bats are present throughout central Arizona. When we see bats in our area, that is most likely the bat that you're seeing. Um, they can inhabit anything from caves, mines, old buildings, bridges, and are found only in the south, south part of Arizona in the winter. The big ear bats also inhabit the caves and mines and can be found all over the desert, scrub, desert mountain shelters, pinions, junipers, and this again is one of the bats that you may see in our, in our general area. So I'm gonna go through some of the pictures. The first set is from Yavapai County, um, those that are frequently, and then we're gonna to get to some that are a little bit more exotic. But the cave myotis are considered to be doing very well. They're not endangered. Their lifespan is between 10 and 15 years, feed on a variety of insects, and are found anywhere from the southwestern US from mid-Texas to southeast California. It is a medium-sized bat with brown or black fur. It has ears are short and pointed and eyes are very small. They can be found in roosting in caves in the summer. Um, some will stay in those caves, but most are migratory for very short distances will go far, as far south as their ability allows them. They are extremely sensitive to human activity and will abandon the roosting area if they are disturbed. Um, they have also been known to uh, roost in shallow nests and other suitable root sites that are not that if their uh, roosting areas are not available. This is the big brown bat. Um, it's, it's of least concern, meaning it's not in the endangered species list. It is considered large for an American bat, 
and it has glossy copper fur. So it is a little bit more distinctive than a lot of the other dark bats that we're used to seeing. They are reported to be one of the fastest bats reaching speeds up to 40 miles an hour and are found at all the different natural habitats in Arizona. They eat um, insects, but they prefer beetles over all the other insects and they love chewing the hard beetles, echo skeleton. These bats can live up to 20 years but may die during their first winter if they didn't store up enough food to survive their hibernation process because of their size. The Mexican free tail bat, I love these pictures by the way, it's only a face that a mother can love as we say. Um, they have a lifespan up to 18 years. Their wings are long and narrow. They also are not threatened or endangered and they love moths as well as insects. And they are known to contain, their roost contain millions of bats at a time. In those colonies, it's expected that they can, estimated that they can eat up to 250 tons of insects every night. Some prefer to roost in caves, but will also choose your attics under bridges, but they again will roost near water. And they are found from South to South America, um, through Central America and Mexico during the winter. The densest concentration of free tail bats are in Bracken Cave near San Antonio, and their colonies can number over 20 million bats at, at any given time. <clears throat> the Townsend Bigger Bat um, it's, is considered medium size, but it looks much larger because of its long ears. Um, when they sit or roost, they take their long ears and they curl them up to look almost like a ram's ear, ram's horn. They are found from Western US, from British Columbia, all the way down to Mexico. It is a late uh, evening flyer. And again, it likes moths and beetles, flies and wasps. It will use a variety of its habitats. And again, it is pretty prevalent in many different areas of our Arizona uh, uh, climates or uh, foliage. And when it's roosting and hibernating, its ears again curl up into, so looking like the ram's horn. They are in decline and are listed as endangered, sensitive, or special concern between five Western states. And most of this is because of the disturbance of their roost sites by humans. Um, this again is our California, uh, uh, long, oops, sorry, long-eared bat. It's um, Large ears, again, are very erect. When it flies, they go to their sides. It's almost, and it allows a little lift in their, in their flying. They like the Sonoran Desert and the Mongo Mongolian Plateau. They live 20 to 30 years. Um, because their wings are very short and broad, they are not suited for long distance flights. So they will hibernate where they typically live. They have a variety of insects, not just flying, but the crickets, bat, uh, beetles, and grasshoppers. It's the only bat in North America known to eat caterpillars, and there are very few. There are among very few insect feeding bats that also eat the cactus fruit. So they prefer habitats to caves, mines, and rock shelters, mostly in the Sonoran Desert scrub, and they are again listed as special concern by the Federal Species of Concern in Arizona and ranked and ranking by the Western Bank Working Group as red and high. The greater mastoff bat is also known as the greater bonneted bat. Um, again, you can see with its ears, they're folded. The largest, it is the largest bat in the United States with very large ears, which extend way out over its heavy snout and small eyes, but it's it has short gray and brown fur, and their wings are long and narrow. They eat insects and roost in tree hollows and caves <coughs> and are found worldwide in warm regions. Um, their habitat must be very large area and with vertical faces because they have to, to get enough lift, they drop 20 feet before they can get enough airborne. <clears throat> they are also considered a species of least concern, <clears throat> excuse me, but have a spe special status of threatened. <clears throat> excuse me. 
or a lesser long-nosed bat, which I thought was a very cute picture, is a pollinator. Um, it can reach speeds up to 14 miles an hour. Um, they feed mostly off of um, the flowers, the nectar, and they're the only species that undergo a long distance migration in order to follow the flowering or fruiting cycle of their food sources, the saguaro, agave, and organ pipe cactus. They are also listed as endangered by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service due to maternity roots being disturbed and habitat loss in the primary areas. This one is um, the night wandering shaggy bat. It has actually silver tips on its hair. So it, it glistens at night under the full moon. Its ears are short and rounded with no fur. They live up to 12 years and is one of the slowest flying bats in North America. It feeds on flies and leaf hoppers, moths, mosquitoes, and a variety of other uh, insects either on the ground or in the air. They are most common bats in the forested area of the United States, but can go up or can be found up into Alaska and southward into Mexico. They are solitary tree roosting species, hibernating in small tree hollows under bark in rock crevices, cliff faces, or caves. It has no specific endangered to threatened status. However, deport, deforestation may pose a threat on the bat in the not too, not too distant future. <clears throat> uh, this beautiful bat is a colorful bat. It's one of our lighter ones. It has yellowish brown to cream colored fur and white fur on its belly. It may live up to 10 years. It feeds on brown dwelling um, prey, such as the scorpion centipedes and praying mantis, grasshoppers, ground beetles, and long horn beetles. They occur in arid and semi-arid regions, obviously, if they're preying on our scorpions. And they can be found, although they can be found from Canada down to Mexico. They do not appear to migrate any great distance as the season change, and they're since they're found in arid regions with rock outcroppings, water must be available close to the sites. And they will typically use three different types of roosts, a day roost, which can be warm, a night roost in, is in the open, but foliage nearby, and a hibernation roost during the winter. Considered a common species with no threat, with some concern due to human encroachment, we can still find them abundant in most of the places that they inhabit. Uh, the rest, here, go one back, sorry. Um, the Western red bat is considered to be one, one of the more beautiful bat species. It's very fluffy. Um, some of these pictures as we get into it almost looks like some of my, my uh, grandkids' little dogs. Their lifespan is 10 to 12 years. Um, they seek flying insects such as moths, ants, and beetles, and they are found in Canada, United States, Mexico, and Central America. They prefer riparian areas dominated by walnuts, oaks, willows, and cottonwoods, and sycamores where they roost in these broadleaf trees. They can be well camouflaged in their tree roofs when they fold their wings over their bodies, they resemble dead leaves. Again, these are not considered threatened or endangered. And the Western Pipistrel is the smallest bat in the United States. Its fur varies from reddish brown to golden and with a white underside. Its lifespan is 10 to 13 years and are often seen foraging for food as many as two hours before other bats emerge from their roosts. They uh, feed on insects, mostly swarming, mo swarming insects like moths, flies, and beetles, and mosquitoes and can be found from Southern Washington from through the Western United States to Southern Mexico. The winter inhabitants of this bat are not well known because they are so small, they sometimes are mostly out of sight. They do like to occupy rodent burrows in the ground if the habitat doesn't provide other suitable shelters. It is listed as threatened and endangered at this time. <clears throat> Uh, 
The spotted bat is a solitary territorial and is one of the rarest bats in the North America. It is, it's a species is of sp a special concern. It is one of the few bats whose echolocation sound is so low that it can be heard by humans. This bat also has large ears with a pinkish tone and its body is jet black in color with two large white spots, one on its rump and one on its snow white fur on its belly. The ears are rolled up around its head when it's resting and inflate with blood and unroll when the bat becomes active. It eats insects and likes tearing off the wings of moths and, it, and then eating only the abdomen. And it can be found from British Columbia, Canada, all the way th through the Western United States into, into Mexico. They will migrate to warmer regions in the winter and will also go into, the, uh, into a torpor or a hibernation in the cold weather. Their body can, temperature can fall to that of its surroundings and its heart rate will slow to survive. So where can we find large colonies of bats? There are about 1,500 bats in the Karchner Caverns in Southern Arizona. Um, if you've ever been there when you're allowed in to see the bats, it's an amazing sight when they are flying in or out. Um, the maternity colony of a species known as the cave myotis lives there from about May through September, and then return to the cave each year to give birth and rear the bats, the young bats there. Again, that state park closes as closes part of the cave to public tourists to protect that process. The Bracken Bat Cave in Texas is home to the world's largest bat colony. Again, it was nearly 20 million of the Mexican free-tailed bats um, that roost there. If you wanna learn more about the Nature's Conservative's efforts to secure 1,521 acres to protect this vital nature, um, you can go to their website. Austin is a seasonal home to the Northern North America's largest urban population of the Mexican free-tailed bats. And it's right beneath the Congress Avenue Bridge. It is a sight to behold if you ever get there and wanna visit when 1.5 million bats can come flowing out from underneath the bridge at any given time of the early day or late evening. A public report on bat colonies uh, and or um, the public can report bat colonies or observations of sick or dead bats to bats at azgfd.gov. Um, this whole presentation was created by a variety of sources, which I, I'm listing here. This presentation is gonna be available on our website. So um, if you are interested in learning any more about these bat species, or going on to the uh, Zoom uh, or the, uh, yeah, the, the Zoom camera, please come and look at the site at a later time. And that's it. There's a lot of information. <laughs> that's a lot of information. I, I think from, uh, Stacy had asked, do you have pictures of the bats? And, um, you did right after that start giving pictures, but I think I could have just looked at nothing but pictures of bats too, because they are so interesting and, and I think they're cute. Okay. I could be the mother. That there was them. one there that you noticed looked just like a pug. Now, if anybody has pugs, my, I, my son and daughter-in-law have three of them and I, I have to say they look just like pugs. <laughs> Well, Ray mentioned something that I thought was rather interesting. We didn't have a lot of questions. I'm waiting to see if there'll be more pop up, but uh, Ray mentioned that uh, pipistrelli, pipistrelli is okay. how you say bats in Italian, not pipistrelle, but, okay, but, but so I thought that was a very interesting comment that um, obviously that's how it got its Americanized name. So mm -hmm. um, I had a question. What is the bat I'm most likely to see in this area? I would say the Mexican free tail bat. And I had the, uh, the joy last um, summer. I, I'm an early riser. I like to go out on our back patio. We, we can look out over uh, towards the mountains. And I sat down with my coffee. It was like 4.30 in the morning. And this bat came right in front of me. And I was sitting under our... Uh, a, a 
balcony and it had this pattern of going this way and then it came back and it went from our house to a little rock formation on the other side of our property then it went up a level did the same formation coming back went up a level did another formation going the other way spent 20 minutes just covering all the area in a very methodical way you must have been eating it was eating Yes. Now well, I like and birds and bees, so I have a ton of water sources, and yeah, probably with the water sources enough uh, mosquitoes during the summer to keep a bat very happy. <laughs> well, as a realtor, I see bats all the time, and I I thought it was the Mexican uh, yep. tail, so that probably was. Uh, Bill wants to know: Is it a good idea for gardeners to do anything to attract bats, uh, like bat houses? So. Um, I went to the Ollie class with uh, with um, Eric from Jay's Birds Barn, and we were talking about the bat houses. And he says you can put one up, but bats are going to go where bats want to go. They, you know, <laughs> they find their safe place to hide, which is going to also be in a in an area easy to get in and out of, have food and have insects. Um, it sort of reminds me of the person who buys ladybugs to put in her garden to eat the bugs and all ladybugs disappear but that means there's not enough food for them so just because you put a bat house up it's really that intense supply of insects okay um sarah wanted to know are bat droppings corrosive i heard that bats that people use this as a reason to chase bats away so are bat droppings corrosive I haven't read that. Um, when we lived in San Diego, we, we had some bats that liked to live under one of our balconies. And all I can tell you about bat guano is it's, it's like tar and it's extremely hard to get up, but I didn't see anything from a corrosive nature of that. Okay. Uh, Steven wants to know, do you know what bats you would find at the Carlsbad Cavern? Um, I'm gonna go back in my slides here because I, I didn't have Carlsbad Caverns, did I, up there? It would probably be some of the same bats that we would see between Texas and here because it's that same corridor of bats. So I would expect that to be, but I did not include that and I apologize. Does anyone else have any other questions? <clears throat> Okay, Lauren, this was an absolutely phenomenal presentation. Like you said, there was lots and lots of information. Um, we do have a lot of bats in our area, if you haven't ever seen them. Um, I hope you'll start looking because um, I know they're there. Our next, oops, we did get another question. We'll throw it out there. <laughs> does any bat, George wants to know, does any bat in Arizona feed on blood? No. <laughs> and um not sure the name on this one um what are the most common type of bats around here i think you did answer that but go right. ahead and do it again um so one of the things this presentation will be posted again on our u of a website so there's a lot of details in this that you know so you just didn't want to go through 100 percent of everything but um, I, I really encourage you to grab this information and um, the department, U.S. Department of Forestry had for me the best information across the board on, on the different bats. There is so much there that you can't, you can't even put it all in one slide. But the Myotis uh, series of bats um, are clearly prevalent in our area, the big brown bats, the Mexican free-tailed bats, and the big eared bats. And each of them, and I, and I talk about Yavapai County, but you can sort of see by the, um, some of them want more of the forest type or some of them want more of the desert. Um, those that have the longer ears, again, are gonna look for areas of large trees where they, when they wanna take off, they can drop and get enough um, incline to get back up. Um, if, a, if a large bat is on the ground, it is most likely gonna have a difficulty of getting up. Mm -hmm. Rosemary actually answered Stephen's questions. Um, she said that the 17 bat species that live in the caverns include the big brown bats, silvered hair bats, and Townsend's big eared bat. Um, 
She says, plan your trip to Carlsbad, New Mexico today to see them all. Yeah. So, thank you, Rosemary. Um, our next one thing I oh, one ahead. thing I did want to note is when they say about um, notifying this Arizona Game and Fish about a bat that you may see either you know on the ground or dead, they are definitely wanting to know about it because this is a way for them to identify a bat in a particular area that may have a disease and they can be actively looking then to see what can they do to um, prevent that disease from, from spreading. Well, our next presentation is going to be on something a little similar, but totally different. A B um, word. <laughs> it's a B word. Um, it's going to be Tuesday, April 26th, again at 6.30. And the title of the presentation is Hey birds, welcome to my backyard. Uh, a great presenter, Joe Glavas, is going to be uh, having that. And I think we'll see a whole different side of uh, flying creatures. And I think a lot of you would enjoy that. So please mark your calendars again, April 26th, and we'll see you all back then, hopefully. Thanks again for attending tonight. Thank you very much.